Uh, now it's time. Um, so this is a plenary talk of uh, Professor P uh, Peter Tino. Um, I'm uh, I'm the Seicho Zawar, uh, who takes uh, chair of this uh, uh, plenary talk. I'm, it's my great, my great pleasure uh, to uh, be a uh, take a chair uh, for the Professor uh, Peter Tino. I, I want to uh, before going to the plenary talk. I'd like to introduce uh, a brief free uh, Peter Tino. Uh, Peter Tino is a um, professor of complex adaptive systems at the School of Computer Science at the University of Birmingham. After finishing his study, university studies in Slovenia, he worked at the NEC Research Institute in Princeton, United States, uh, Slovak University of Technology, and the Australian Research Institute for AI. Aston University and the University of Birmingham in 2003. And Tino has broad area of research interest in dynamic power system, machine learning, natural computation, and uh, fractal geometry. In particular, I assume his uh, today's talk comes from his interest in the theoretical underpinning of recurrent neural networks, which covers broad, uh, which can cover broad types of uh, recently attracted uh, neural architecture from uh, simple RN to LSTM, Transformer Excel. Uh, in today's talk, uh, we can expect to have uh, uh, his interesting view for the RN uh, as a state space modeling, non autonomous dynamic systems, temporal filters, and the temporal future space, uh, which seems to be very exciting. So um, please start uh, your talk, Pino. Peter, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, um, I would just like to say at the beginning that this is going to be a personal view. So there is going to be lots of things I will not mention. I can't mention because of the lack of time. There's going to be lots of names I would need to mention, but I will not be able to mention. And I just think that it's useful to look back a little bit at the history of what we were trying to do when it came to the recurrent neural networks and a, big, uh, a little bit to the future as well. So first of all, I would just like to say that this uh, part of this work has been uh, supported by an ITN project from EU Horizon 2020, Sundial, and also I'm Alan Turing uh, Institute Fellow, and in particular, I would like to say that there is a very interesting interest group, machine learning and dynamic systems, of which I'm part, and they have very nice activities uh, in this domain. By no means, this work was done just by myself. I enjoyed lots of discussions with lots of people uh, that inspired me and contributed to the work. And here are just a few names uh, that I just felt I need to mention. Of course, there's lots of na other names that I should have mentioned, but I can't. Uh, okay, let's just start. Uh, so this talk is going to be about our attempts to understand recurrent neural networks. As we know from deep networks, it's very difficult to understand these parameterized highly nonlinear models. Uh, and if it is difficult to understand really what deep networks are performing, it's even more difficult to understand what recurrent neural networks are performing. So I'd like to look a little bit back at, at, the, at the attempts that people have done to understand what the recurrent neural networks are about. And also I would like to suggest a new framework maybe that we can use in order to understand um, from a completely different viewpoint what these recurrent networks are doing. So this talk is not going to be about smart architectures of recurrent neural networks um, that enable us, for example, to propagate gradients more effectively through time, such as LSTM and gating units and so on. But it's more going to be about conceptual level, what recurrent neural networks are really about and how we can attempt to try to understand what they are doing. So I will, uh, this talk will have two parts. The first part is going to be devoted to state space structures um, that are trained for specific tasks and how we can grasp what they are doing. In particular, 
uh, I will show that it is very useful to consider recurrent neural networks as so-called iterative function systems. And this is particularly useful if you have only finite alphabets or finite number of inputs that we can plug in into the uh, input time series. And then the second talk will, uh, the second part of the talk will be devoted to state space structures that we don't train, but somehow magically work. So I just call them general purpose state space structures, and this is the domain of reservoir computation, where the state space structures uh, form uh, and, and representations of input time series that I would like to view as feature space representations in kernel machines. So from that point of view, I would like to think about recurrent neural networks as temporal feature spaces. So this is going to be analogy with kernel machines. So let's go straight into, into the talk. So we observed an input time series UT. This is going to be my notations. The inputs are denoted by U. T is the time index. I'm going to consider discrete time, but you can imagine that you can have also continuous time. At certain times ti, we are asked to produce a response. So our responses y at time ti are going to be based on everything, potentially everything we have observed till the time ti. And here is the set of all inputs that I need to consider in order to produce my response at time ti. Now, obviously, immediately I have two questions that I need to answer. How to organize learning in this case? We need to capture temporal dependencies among the inputs. Um, uh, as opposed to the usual learning setting where we can think of inputs as, as IID, as generated independently from some distribution, in this case, I can't do it. And actually, that's the whole point, that the inputs are temporarily correlated or dependent, and I need to capture that. The second question is, how do I going to represent, how am I going to represent the input histories? Because at every time to AI, I have seen more and more inputs. That means my input, which is the whole series that I have seen up to time TI, is of different length. And here is a potential solution to that. I'm going to think about state space models. And these state space models is a very powerful class of models because they have a core concept of information processing state, IPS. Now the information processing state at time t is, it can be thought of as coding everything that we need to remember from the entire history of symbols up to time t that is needed in order to perform a given task. And I just would like to mention that the, the notion of states uh, has emerged in many fields, for example, in computer science, states uh, are known as equivalence classes over all temporal sequences in order uh, that I need to use in order, for example, to determine whether a string is grammatical or not. So we talk about finite state automata. Uh, in Markov chains, this is a particularly simplifying assumption where I say, well, from everything that I have, uh, I have seen so far, I can form equivalence classes in a very simple way because I need to only consider the past n inputs. And that's Markov chain of order n. The generalization of it is so-called prediction suffix trees where I allow variable memory length dependent on the context. The states also emerge quite naturally through so-called information bottleneck method of Naftali Tishbi for example, on temporal data, where we have an associated task on it and we need to put it through the information bottleneck and so on. So this is a, an old notion that is quite useful of the information processing state. Now, because information processing state at time t codes everything that I need to remember up to time t, this is completely equivalent to, stay, to saying, well, Information processing state at time t is basically the same thing as information processing state at time t minus one. So everything I have observed it till time t, t minus one and my current input ut. So if I put these two things together, I should have some representation of everything I have seen so far up to time t. And indeed, this is so-called state transition mapping, which is denoted here by f. And the crucial thing is that we get recursive updates of our information processing state. My new state at time t is determined by my previous state and my current input. And because my information processing state um, codes all the information that I need to remember up to time t, then my output, my response, um, based on everything I have seen up to this time, can be just simply 
done by a readout mapping from my current state, yt. So this is going to be our basic setting. This is a very general setting. It's a setting that indeed encompasses finite state automata, a mem variable memory in Markov chains, a hidden Markov models, a recurrent neural networks, common filters, and so on. This is a very general setting. Of course, for common filters, I would need to introduce distributions uh, over that. So we will just have conditional probabilities. Now, what do I mean by learning in this setting? By learning, then I mean, you give me a given task, you give me a lot of time series with associated outputs, and I need to simply pick or learn an appropriate dynamical system of this sort. Now, we call these dynamical systems non-autonomous systems, because if I didn't have this UT, it would be a classical dynamical system, which we call autonomous dynamical system, that is changed, the state is changing over time. But now I have out external out inputs, that can drive the system. That's why we call it non-autonomous dynamical system. So I need to pick the right F and I need to pick the right readout from my states. Now, in some cases, this is very, this is very simple and we can do it by hand. And here is an example. If I tell you that you have two inputs, A and B, and you observe time series over A and B, and you need to say whether your input sequence that you have seen so far contained odd or even number of Bs. Now, this is what we would do. We would have two information processing states. One is for even number of Bs, two is for odd number of Bs. And we know that when A comes, I can just loop over, over this state, nothing changes, and I need to wait for B. When B comes, I need to move to the state two. And again, if B comes, I need to move to state one. And again, in state two, I can just loop on symbol A. What does it mean? I have a state transition mapping that says I need two states. On symbol A, you stay in the same state. On symbol B, you go to the second state, and so on. This is a fine, very trivial finite state automaton. It's, I'm just illustrating here that, to me, mathematically, this is about the same thing as recurrent neural networks. And, uh, and, I, and for this case, I can hand design the state space structures. So I can hand design that I need two states. I can hand design that I have these transitions. And I can hand design the readout function. Very simple, but it's not always the case, and sometimes we need to learn. So what we do? What do we do? Well, we can have. Uh, it's about these two mappings: state transition mapping F and the readout mapping H. Now we can say, well, these can be these can be neural networks. So you just introduce some parametrization. These are the parameters. These are the parameters for the state transition function, and these are the parameters for the readout function. And if these two things are, are neural networks, then we call the whole state space model a recurrent neural network. And here is the very simple, the simplest possible example you can think of. Uh, we know all obviously uh, what this means. These are the sigmoid transfer functions and these are the connection weights. And this is just the simplest possible formulation of these two functions as the simplest recurrent neural, uh, neural networks. And this is so-called Elman, simple Elman um, neural network. But now, obviously, we have much more complicated recurrent neural networks, but they have all this form, or almost all, or they can be transferred, uh, trans somehow transformed to this form. OK. So now I'm going to talk about what do we do if we have finite number of of uh, uh, inputs uh, that I can I can use in order to form my time series, and how can I understand what the, my recurrent neural network is doing? So let's just think about an alphabet A that is a capital A symbols, and uh, obviously in this case my my transition function can be decomposed into A different transition functions because I can plug in different input you here. And so for every input from the alphabet, I, I get a different functions. I have F1, F2, and so on, I have A. And the system of these, uh, the collection of these functions is called iterative function system. Um, so this is my parameterization. I, 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 uh, I propose to study, or, or you know, people propose to study recurrent neural networks simply as a collection of these fixed mappings as an uh, iterative function system. Now, the advantage is that we did a little trick because we, we can study each of these dynamical mappings as an autonomous dynamical system. And there is a very rich 
theory that has been developed for autonomous dynamic systems, unlike for non-autonomous dynamic systems where things are very difficult, even if you try to translate the usual concepts from um, the autonomous dynamic systems, such as attractors, chaos, and so on, this is very difficult to do if you have non-autonomous dynamic system, and it, things become a bit awkward. Now, so the recurrent neural networks dynamics can be then viewed as an interplay of actions of these different um, uh, dynamic systems. And here I just mentioned a few names. Um, that um, have done interesting work. For example, Kenny Doya was the first one to, 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 to study learning in this context. And, you know, Kenny came uh, with the idea that, well, when I, when I train these parameters WS, it just means that I drive my dynamical mappings for a series of bifurcations. And that, that's why we can understand why it's so difficult sometimes to train, uh, not only reason, but why it's difficult to train these recurrent neural networks. And um, also, um, what does it mean that my recurrent neural network has a stable transition? And so on, Janet Wiles has done interesting work with Jeff Elfman on context-free, learning context-free structures and so on. Okay, so here is again the simple example that allows me to illustrate what is going on. So uh, here again, imagine that we have the task of, I have two symbols, one, two now, and I need to say whether the time series that is driving my recurrent network has seen even or odd number of symbols too. Now we know from the previous example that we need two states. Well, a, one thing to mention here is that on state A, I need to cycle on symbol one, and on state B, I need to cycle on symbol one as well. So that means if I'm in state A, I cannot escape. If I'm in state B, I cannot escape. And on symbol two, I need to jump between the two states. So here is a dynamical system um, as a cartoon picture illustration of that. What does it mean? Well, I have two attractive sets. In this case, it's, a, it's the simplest possible attractive set for dynamics F1, which is attractive fixed point. Here's another attractive fixed point. And in between them is so-called saddle type of fixed point for the dynamics F1. And whenever I'm in this basin of attraction and I observe symbol one, I'm just attracted to this set and I stay here all the time. And when I, whenever I'm in this basin of attraction, I'm just attracted here and stay there. And on symbol two, I have a different mapping, F2. And this mapping has to have a stable periodic orbit of period two that allows me to jump between the two regions of attraction. So it's, it's a little bit like being in the mountains. You have two valleys over here. One, one valley is here, another valley is here. There is one peak here, one peak here. There is a settle point in between. And whenever you start in this valley, you just go down on symbol one. Whenever you are here, you just go one on symbol one. And then on symbol two, you just jump from one valley to the other. So there are two important things to mention here. Uh, this has been, uh, this is related to so-called information latching problem. And the information latching problem in this context can be understood very simply by saying, I need to form attractive sets, whether they are periodic orbits or whether they are attractive fixed points or whatever I need in order to latch the information from the past. But as soon as I try to form my attractive sets, I, I need to propagate the temporal information through time, but the Jacobian, the derivatives, and in the neighborhood of my attractive sets are very small. By definition, nothing changes. It's an attractive set. The dynamics is, is, is not changing. So I, by the chain rule, I multiply through time, very simple derivatives, very small. And that means they are exponentially vanishing. Now, one thing that I would also like to mention here, there is a very rich literature where people recognize that this needs to be represented in this stable manner. So if you concentrate on clusters of activations, these clusters of activations in recurrent networks usually correspond to attractive sets. And if you identify clusters as abstract information processing states, simply by driving the recurrent neural network and realizing in which cluster you are, you can extract finite state representations of this form. And indeed, uh, they can be stable representations 
in in a in a, in, a, in a nice illustrative rule sort of type of, of, of format of what the recurrent neural neural network has learned and what it does. Okay, so in particular, it's quite interesting to know that if you want to create a new attractive fixed point, this is usually uh, formed through so-called saddle node bifurcation. Okay, and and one last slide in this um, in uh, in this uh, subtopic of this talk is just to show that we can use this in order to understand what is wrong with the recurrent neural networks. So for example, this is a special automaton. This is designed so that I need four attractive sets on symbol A, one, two, three, four. So you can imagine it as being in four rooms and in some uh, circumstances you need to stay in the room. And if some conditions are fulfilled, you need to transform from one room to the other. But of course the robot or the recurrent neural network doesn't know anything about this structure and it needs to learn about this structure from the examples. So I need four attractive sets on symbol A and here is an example of what happens if the, this, uh, the recurrent network that is trained on this structure can cheat, can somehow perform as if it didn't use this structure, but actually only if you have relatively small number of consecutive A's. So if I put in five consecutive A's, it still would perform perfect task. But if I try to perform, to put here say 10 or 20, then the performance start to deteriorate. And if, I, if we look at this system as iterative function system, I can understand why this is happening. So for example, this is one, one solution that actually was learned. I, have, I should have four attractive fixed points for symbol A because I have four loops as you can see here, but I have only two, I have one and two. And I have a saddle fixed point that is, that is uh, sitting between them. Now the saddle fixed point means that if you are on a stable manifold of this the saddle fixed point as in the mountains, if you are here, you can go straight into the saddle point and then you can go downhill. However, if you start a little bit, not exactly on the stable manifold, but if you start a little bit off it, by continuity of the dynamics, you follow the stable manifold, but then comes the point where you are thrown away out of it. And this is a mechanism that enables the neural network to cheat recurrent network. So for example, I have an attractive point here and here I can present as many A's as I like, no problem. When I see B, I'm thrown here. Now I can sh you can show me five consecutive A's, for example, and I, I, I'm slowly moving along this stable manifold and I still give you the right response. But eventually, if you overdo it with, with giving me more A's, I will converge to this fixed point and the performance goes down. If you show me another B, I jump on the other side, a little bit close to the reach of, this, of the stable manifold and I move over here, still give you the right response for five or six consecutive A's, but then the performance deteriorates. And again, on, on, uh, in this attractive fixed point, say in this state T, um, I, you can show me as many A's as you like. So this is actually quite interesting um, because it shows you that we can indeed use this idea of iterative function systems to understand what the network is doing, what the network has learned and when the network will fail in the future. So this, is, this was just a very brief overview of, of what people have done before, including me, in order to try to understand, to look inside the neural network, uh, recurrent neural network, what is happening. Now I would like to devote the second part of this talk to um, a different notion of recurrent neural network where we said, well, we have this information latching problem, we have this vanishing gradient, exploding gradient problems. And indeed you can come up with um, LSTM architectures and, and gating units and whatever. But, uh, but there is another class of models that says, well, maybe we don't have to even train the dynamic part of the network. So these non-autonomous systems just fix them. Of course, the question is how I'm going to fix them. And the advantage of doing this is that only a very simple static readout is trained. So uh, this is the field of so-called reservoir architectures. Um, Echo state network is a, is a famous example by Herbert Jaeger. Another famous example is liquid state machines. There is also there are also a, two other um, examples of this when your input time series is symbolic, especially 
but they are still reservoir models, recurrent neural networks. Uh, one is called fractal prediction machine and another neural prediction machine. And, and they have all in common that they simply fix the dynamics to something really simple. And the readout, again, is very simple. It can be done in linear time, absolutely not a problem. So for example, in echo-state network liquid state machine is a linear regression. In fractal prediction machine is a piecewise multinomial distribution, you just count. It's very simple. Okay. So, um, uh, this, this, um, sorry, okay. Uh, these notions of, of re reservoir computation are very closely related. I don't have really too much time to go deep into this, but they are related to so called Markovian architectural bias of recurrent neural networks. And uh, what is the deal? The deal here is that if you generate, if you uh, initiate your recurrent neural network with small weights, which is the usual thing, um, because you don't want overcomplicated recurrent neural network to start, you want to start from something simple. This leads to, to contractive dynamics. What do I mean by that? These mappings F are all contractions. There exists a Lipschitz constant so that this is a contraction. So the Lipschitz constant is less than one. And of course, then you can imagine that you can extend this notion of the fixed input u to the fixed input time series u1 up to time uh, up to ut. You start in the initial state x0 and then you produce after seeing t inputs state xt. And by a very simple argument, you can show that if I drive my, my recurrent network with two inputs, they are uh, two input time series, they are different, but they have the same common suffix q, then, then the state, the final states that are obtained by driving this are never further away than this. This is the diameter of your state space. And this is the exponentially decaying term because c is less than one. And of course, the longer is q, the closer are the states. And why is this Markovian? Well, because the longer is the common suffix of the two time series I observe, the closer I force my activations to lie. And because we know that the outputs are produced by a smooth mapping from the state space, that means that the closer are going to be the outputs in this case. So, um, so the, the usual Markovian idea is that if you, if you observe the same common suffix, then the responses should be in some way similar. And you get this for free simply by randomly generating uh, a neural recurrent neural network ways uh, close to, um, to, to zero with a small weight. Okay, so there is a, a, a more formal theoretical grounding for this. For example, I just show you two theorems. One is that we made with Barbara and that says all these recurrent neural networks with contractive transition functions can be approximated arbitrarily well on input sequences of unbounded length by a definite memory machine, which is indeed a finite memory, input memory um, machine known in computer science. And every definite memory machine can be simulated by recurrent network with uh, contractive uh, transition function. Now, this is vaguely related to what we call echo state property in echo state networks. It's not exactly the same, but it's very closely related. And I don't have really time now to go into, into details. Another interesting thing is one can ask, well, how is the complexity of my driving input stream? Because now this is a general purpose recurrent neural network. I don't train it. So is it the case that we, if I have more complex input time series, then somehow the state's organization reflects this complexity or not? And actually you can prove a theorem that's saying, well, give me a complexity measure of your time series. If you have symbolic time series, a very natural complexity measure is so-called topological entropy of, of, the, of the driving source um, that generates my, uh, my input time series. And if you look at the state space activations, a natural complexity measure of you know, how diverse are your state space activations is a fractal dimension of the state activations, state space activations. And one can prove that up to a scaling constant, uh, they can be uh, closely related to one another. This can be actually generalized to 
uh, to uh, measure type of arguments, not topological. So you can introduce a measure on top of your fractal, then you have multi-fractals and so on, entropy spectra. But this is actually quite interesting and it actually shows that this general purpose uh, dynamical setting of contractive dynamics makes, uh, makes sense. Now, I'm going to finish this talk by saying um, what can be a possible new framework for studying such uh, recurrent neural networks, or at least of the form that I showed you, showed you now. And this is related to the notion of recurrent neural networks as feature spaces. So I know that most of us know about kernel machines, but just for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to recapitulate very quickly the basic notions so that we know what we are talking about. So imagine you have a classification task and you can form a classifier. This is a linear classifier. Uh, VW is just simply a uh, normal vector to the separation hyperplane. There is a bias term, but basically this dot product of the, with the input of the separating of the normal vector is positive, then it's, it's a red class. If it's negative, it's a blue class. So this is mathematical writing of what I just said. It's a sign of this dot product plus it will be Now it's, it's quite natural to say that this normal vector to the separating hyperplane must lie in a span of um, of your inputs. Um, so this is a definition of that. So it's a linear combination of inputs. If you plug it in back into this, um, into this basic equation, you get this. So what do we get? If I want an output on my input u, it's basically obtained through a sign of a sum of lots of dot products. And these dot products are the thing that tells me how close my current input is to my previous inputs. And these are the, the constants. These constants can be obtained in different frameworks, perceptron, super vector machine, relevance vector machine, and so on. Okay, so now the usual trick is to say, yeah, but now I'm going to transform my U into so-called feature space by some mapping phi. And, and then my dot products are going to be done in this feature space. So now I do a, do a dot product on the feature representations of my U. So it's not on U, but on feature representations. And this can be done for a kernel. So this kernel is a dot product of U and UI, but not of them on them, but on the feature representations. And that's the whole thing about kernel machines. And now I would like to view my dynamical system, my recurrent neural network as a temporal feature space. So what do I do? Well, I observe possibly left infinite time series up to time t minus one. And I say, here's a state. And this state is supposed to represent what I have seen up to time t minus one. And I'm just going to say, well, to me, this is a feature space representation of the whole time series I have seen. And I call it like phi, feature space image of this time series. Obviously at time t, I have seen everything up to time t, including my new input ut. So the feature space representation is this. And the crucial thing is that these two feature space representations, I can glue together through a feature mapping uh, through the dynamical transition map f. And the output is given from my feature space representations x. And again, exactly in the same way as kernel machines, this is going to be simply done by a dot product of my feature space representation with my training inputs, feature space representation of my training inputs, except for in this case, my training inputs are feature space representations of the time series I have seen so far. So in, for example, in the case of super vector machine, I can talk about support times, for example, or support time series that I have seen before. Right? So if you are more interested in the dynamic, in the mathematical development of this, this is the paper. Um, that um, where I just developed this framework. In. Okay, so now let's just think, uh, let's just push it forward. So I have an input stream up to time, uh, up to time t. Um, I'm just going to consider univariate time series and I'm just going to consider a linear dynamical system um, where capital W are the, the um, dynamical coupling of the states and the vector W is the coupling from my inputs to the states. So it's the usual thing. Again, is a state transition map. 
And I need the contractive dynamics as I explained before. So the maximum single value of one is um, it going to be less than one of W is, less, is going to be less than one. And now I put a time series U and I put a time series B. I put it through the recurrent neural network and I say, what kernel does this recurrent neural network really define in this case? So, because it's a linear dynamical system, I know that my kernel is going to be of this form. So this Q is a, a positive, uh, maybe semi-definite matrix. Uh, so it's, um, it's not really a metric tensor, but uh, let's not go into uh, mathematical details over here. And the crucial thing is my kernel on two time series, U and V. Remember that these can be arbitrary length. Uh, these two time series, the, the, the kernel is defined by this, I will call it metric tensor, by this, by this matrix Q. And it's a symmetric matrix. Um, and it's uh, definitely positive, semi-definite. So I can do a, an eigenvector, uh, eigen decomposition of this, and then it can be represented as, as, as this. M is just simply a matrix that contains eigenvectors as columns of this operator. And this is, these are the eigenvalues of that. Of course, it can be then rewritten as a usual dot product of the transformed time series, right? So I have to take my original time series and then I multiply with this matrix. Then I take my time series, original time series B, multiply with this matrix, then I do a classical dot product. This is my kernel that my recurrent neural network is doing. Why is this important? Well, because these, this matrix M, this, this new axis, this eigenaxis that, that I extract, I can think of them as a feature space motifs because I compare my current time series U with the eigenvectors with these motifs of the operator Q. And based on how similar my current time series U is to the current motif, to this, uh, to this eigen time series uh, stored as a column of this matrix um, that's, that's part of my feature space representations of this input U. And then I scale different motifs with different weights. And those are the weightings of the scheme. They are the square roots of the eigenvalues, right? And, I, and the crucial thing is that I'm going to think about this feature space, a rich feature space, if I have a large variety of different motifs in here. I compare my time series with many, many different possible time series that I could have seen um, with possibly significant weights. So I'm not interested in motifs that have negligible weights over here. So let's try to see what is happening. And I will just give you hints of, of some theory with, the, with uh, some, uh, some illustrative pictures. So um, I'm going to consider three settings for this, uh, for this dynamical system. One, as usual in eco-state networks, I'm just going to consider completely random dynamical coupling generated IID um, of, of these weights. Then I'm going to consider random but symmetric, um, so-called Wigner um, uh, matrices of, of the dynamical coupling. And then I'm going to consider a very minimal, minimalist setting of, of the network that has only two free parameters. Uh, okay, so in all the examples, I'm going to use state space dimensionality 100. I'm going to renormalize uh, dynamical coupling so that I have contracted mapping. So the maximum single value is going to be 0 0.995 and the input coupling is renormalized to unit length. And I'm going to show you motifs so this richness, richness of feature space representations up to um, 10 to the minus two of the highest motive weight. So otherwise things can be considered quite neg negligible. Okay. So what happens if you do all the theory, what happens if I use a random generation of my dynamical coupling? So I have two time series U, I have these, these, are, the, these are the elements that I have seen before and I end up with U1. Uh, I have V, we, we, uh, this is the past and this is my current input V1. So I can prove that the, the, the kernel can be approximated quite closely with this expression. But what is this expression? This expression simply is a dot product of the two time series, as you can see, I, and it's just a weighted dot product of the two time series. So I'm just taking the two time series and I'm just comparing them element by element 
and weighting very brutally, as you can see, because sigma max is less than one. When you divide it by two, and the exponent is two times i minus one. So this is really decaying very fast over here um, uh, into the past. So it's really just very recent element. And this is a geometric representation. So, so if I, I have only seven, so remember this is 100 dimensional uh, dynamical system. So potentially I can have 100 motifs, but I have only seven because all the others have very negligible motif weights. And what are these motifs doing? Indeed. This is, the, this is the current input, and these are the inputs into the past. I could have gone almost like infinitely um, back into the past, but I took, I took the past last 200 inputs because everything else is just uh, almost zero in the weighting. And you can see that these motifs actually capture only the last scene symbol, or the, the last scene type series, sorry, uh, element over here. And this are the motive weights. So this is just the geometric representation of this equation, right? Each motive is, is picking only the, the last, the second last, the motive before that, and so on, elements of the time series. Everything else is zero, nothing. And then these are the motive weights. What happens if we have symmetric weights and still random? Then we can show that your kernel is going to be a linear combination of special kernels. And each special kernel on time series U and V can, uh, has only one motif, and the motifs have this form. This is a motif for kernel A, and sigma are the non-zero eigenvalues of, the, of your coupling matrix W. And you can see that if the eigenvalue is uh, positive, then this is simply an exponentially decaying motif. If the eigenvalue is negative, that this is highly oscillating um, motif, uh, exponentially decaying, uh, right? So if you look at the examples again, I, I, even though I could have 100 motifs, I have only 10 because otherwise things are decaying very fast. And you have either, uh, you have a mixture of, of highly oscillating motifs or, or exponentially decaying motifs. So I can't, I can't uh, go into more into what exactly we are looking at, but, but at least you have some hint over this. But this is still very restrictive. So what happens if we take an architecture of, of the recurrent neural network that is minimalist? And you know why I did this? Because I was always intrigued by the fact that if you, if you think about kernel machines, uh, you go to a rich feature space, but the kernel that gets you to a feature, uh, to the rich feature space um, has very few degrees of freedom. So for example, if you use a Gaussian kernel, you have only the width of the kernel if you don't, if you, if you don't train the diagonal elements. But this already is pretty good, we know, in practical applications. So you have one degree of freedom in order to define your feature space, yet the feature space is rich enough to give you good performance in many practical tasks. And I was thinking, well, can we have the same in temporal kernel? And indeed, there is this architecture that we call simple cycle reservoir architecture, where you have n recurrent units, so you have n-dimensional features, temporal feature space or state space, but the units are only coupled in a circle. So there is a circle topo ring topology and each connection weight is the same, is raw here, right? Um, then obviously this is also the uh, maximum singular value of this and so on. So it's only one degree of freedom, extremely simple. Now, this coupling of inputs to the state space, I need two different and different weights because I have n units in here, right? n dimensional state space. But I'm going to say that all these weights again have the same weight. Absolute value is the same. The only thing that is different are the signs, plus one, minus one, or the, just the signs of in here. And I need to break the symmetry and Intuitively, it's very clear that these signs need to be aperiodic, but that's that's only intuition. And then I will show you why why this uh, this is not just an intuition. Okay, so so I have two degrees of freedom, 
I have the cycle weight and I have the weight on the connection from input unit to the state space. And uh, that's the absolute value. And then of course, a periodic sign pattern over here. Now the aperiodic sign pattern is very simple because I can just use a binary expansion of an irrational number, for example, pi, and that gives me aperiodic pattern of, uh, of uh, zeros and ones, which I can transfer into an aperiodic pattern on sign. If we do this, so this is a little bit of a theory that already tells us that it's going to be a very interesting, um, the motive structure is much more interesting than before. First of all, we see that the motive structure has a block form and the only thing is that these, uh, the, the blocks are of length n, and n is the number of neurons uh, uh, in your recurrent network, so it's, so it's the dimensionality, and they are exponentially scaled down, different copies of that. The, um, the weights of, the, um, of these motifs are, um, I can go into the theory, but, but um, they can be shown that they are going to be much higher than the weights that we have seen before. And here's a picture. Now remember what we have seen before was seven motifs or 10 motifs. So what, we, what I have seen in the architectures before would be just a picture that show you a very, very tiny column in here and everything else would be zero. Now this is, now I have 100 non-trivial uh, motifs, possible time series. So the feature space is really rich in here. You can clearly see the motif structure that is predicted, the block structure of the motifs that is predicted by the theory. And the weights are all quite significant all the way to 100. So this is a stark contrast to the cases that I had before, right? Where instead of 100, I have seven here, or I have um, 10. Okay, now what happens if I have random? So this was a, the uh, aperiodic sign pattern was um, expansion of pi. And this is what happens if I have random signs. Very similar picture, except for here, except for this, I, um, I don't claim that I don't need any randomness in the construction of dynamical system. I can just do it completely deterministically in a very trivial way, right? Um, there is another theorem that one can prove that it's a bit too complicated. I'm just not going to present it here as a theorem, but I'm just going to say that you can show what is the consequence of not having an aperiodic sign pattern in here, right? If you have a periodic sign pattern, for example, plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, 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 minus, minus, and so on. So then, the motif or the richness of the feature space is reduced dramatically. For example, here I had the block only uh, of length 10 of the, that was repeated for the sign patterns. Then you can show that, that uh, you have only that many motifs and the motifs become much more trivial than before, right? They still have deep memory, much deeper memory than the motifs that we have seen before, but they are trivial, the motifs. Okay, so they are again periodic motifs. Um, so this is a consequence of not having a periodic sign pattern. Now you can you can again compare it with the motifs that we had here, where the simply the whole thing was zero all the time, or here, the exponential decay. So so um, so um, this is quite constraining, but still a, a little bit better than what we had before. And here. I would like to finish because I can see that my time is, is uh, gradually up, um, but I would just like to, um, to uh, send uh, home messages. So the first take home message is to say, to understand what is happening inside recurrent neural networks is even more complicated than to understand what is happening inside classical uh, neural networks with layered structure. Uh, we need to simply approach recurrent neural networks for what they are. And they are really dynamical systems. What is worse, they are non-autonomous dynamical systems, which make, makes the analysis much more difficult um, than before. Um, and we have basically two options. If we don't have too many different possible inputs that can form uh, the time series, 
um, then we can analyze recurrent neural networks as a sequence or as a collection of autonomous dynamical systems, attractive sets, their combination, their interplay, their bifurcations, and so on. If we have continuous inputs, um, in case of these general purpose architectures, we can, we can view these um, general purpose recurrent neural networks called reservoir models as temporal feature spaces. And we can attempt to do some theoretical un understanding of the richness of this feature space. So I would just like to mention that this is this can be viewed as simply um, um, is complement to the very nice work that has been done by Ludmira Grigoreva or um, Juan Pablo Ortega and so on. And people that have tried to think about um, um, approximating capabilities of these types of architectures as a class of models. Here is an attempt to say, no, I have a particular recurrent neural network and I would like to, for this particular recurrent neural network, claim whether it has a rich representation as a feature space in this dynamical space, state space or not. Um, and with this, I would just like to thank you for your attention. And if you have uh, some questions, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. So um, we start our QA time. So I haven't had any question comments on over our chat, uh, but uh, you can uh, put off, turn off your mute and uh, directly give your questions. So uh, I have a, a first question. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for your uh, great talk. And uh, I, I may not uh, completely have an understanding of your talk. It's uh, very theoretical. And uh, so, so you, you gave us uh, some uh, different view about the uh, temporal, um, uh, I mean, training, temporal uh, tra learning of the temporal patterns. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah. you. Mm -hmm. And um, you try to explain about uh, the some dynamic structure in the future space uh, using uh, some kernel, uh, temp um, kernel. I mean space uh, space view. So, but the, so you are uh, currently uh, you are trying to represent the kernel space of the temporal patterns, uh, which has uh, some discrete time sequences, but uh, can you extend this concept to the continuous um, sequences? Yeah, so that's, that's a very good question. Uh, you can, you can. So mm -hmm. um, the principle of, so the mathematics would need to change a little bit, but the principle mm -hmm. behind this is very simple. I have a recurrent neural network. The basic notion, the, the core concept of recurrent network is that somehow in my state space, I have to represent what I have seen so far. And only then I produce my outputs. So this is very similar to what kernel machines are doing. They are saying, okay, I see these inputs and I'm going to represent my input in another space. We call them feature space. And then I'm, I, I will produce my outputs only using those feature space representations of my inputs. Uh, so, whether you observe a continuous time stream, so you have a continuous uh, time recurring neural network, which is ordinary differential equations, blah, blah, blah. So it is the same thing, right? because at given time t, your state space, your state is representing everything you have seen so far, right? And, and then only based on that, you are producing your outputs. Mm. So from this point of view, it is, it is again the same thing, right? And, and um, so I, uh, metam as I said, of course, the mathematical developments would need to be slightly different, but the core idea should go through. And why I was particularly interested in this analog is exactly what I said, is that for the kernel machines, you can generate very simple, very rich representations using very free degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So I was just basically asking, can you have the same thing in this situation where you have very few degrees of freedom to play, 
yet I've produced very high dimensional dynamical systems that have rich representations of my temporal time series. And this is exactly what it's, it's doing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so audience, uh, do you have any questions, comments? Uh, I have uh, questions uh, over chat. Uh, what would change if you have multiple layers? Can you reduce them into a single equivalent, equivalent layer? Um, what? Aha, what, uh, what would change if you have multiple layers? Can you reduce them into a single equivalent layer? Okay, so of course in, in the linear case, right? If you have a linear dynamical system, you can reduce the layers down. Of course, you can't do it if you had nonlinearity. And, um, and uh, one thing I need to emphasize here is that if I had nonlinearity in my dynamical system, any closed form, nice analytical expression of this kernel would be very difficult, right? So, uh, um, um, so yeah, so, uh, so from this point of view, uh, yes, you can do it in the linear case, but not in the, in the, yeah. Okay. So uh, the second question is in, uh -huh. in your plenary talk of WCCI 2020, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Johan Shuken described an SVM basically bots machine duality. Yeah. 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 So. How uh, look at this? Yeah. Okay. So this is, uh, in some sense, related. It's it's not exactly the same thing, uh, mm. but uh, indeed it is uh, it is related to. Um, so if you view um, multi-layered deep network is somehow you know this this connection that people make with recurrent neural networks, then indeed you can make this connection. Um, um, however. Um, so, okay, I can't really go into, into the details of this, but this, this idea of studying the richness of the feature space in terms of, in terms of motifs is uh, slightly different uh, from this, yeah. Actually, I, um, I discussed uh, uh, with Johan because recently we gave both talks at, at another conference, yeah. Okay, have you any other questions? Say about the uh, yeah, so if, if there are no, no other questions, I would just like to say that uh, um, I think, um, I think we, we, we really deeply need to have some way of analysis of what is going on inside complex recurrent neural networks. Uh, because we got to the stage where we can train very complicated architectures. Uh, that got complicated because of problems with the gradients and so on that we had before. But the downside of this is that it's very difficult to really understand what they represent. And in some applications, um, it, it can be really crucial to understand um, what actually the, the recurrent neural network is doing. Um, right, there is a question. Uh, yeah, what yeah. about mixtures of specialized recurrent neural networks some with specific functionalities? Right. Um, so, um, right. So the mixture formulation is a very powerful formulation because you basically form a different it's uh, recurrent neural networks um, that are able to be experts in their domain. So um, um, there. One way of looking at the mixtures of recurrent neural networks is well, you have them because you want to deal with non stationarity. You have different regimes, and in different regimes uh, in your input stream, you have to have different recurrent neural networks um, that, are, that are responding. Um, each, each expert in their, in, in, in their, uh, in their domain. Uh, um, so I would say that in this case, you can still do the same kind of analysis, but uh, you need to overall then brew the analysis into the mixture uh, framework, where you just say, well, each, each component is responsible for its own input domain, as if. 
and um, and analyze it in this way. Exactly in the same way as we would analyze uh, static uh, mixtures, mixture models. And the Yonsek also had uh, some other questions. Can you model phenomena with a multiple time scales? Uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, um, right. So there have been dedicated architectures for dealing with multiple time scales. Uh, all I can say for now uh, is that, for example, you know this uh, uh, tuning of maximum um, singular value um, is related to tuning your time scale because if it's very short, then your memory is very short. If it's longer, due to stability, it's, it's long. And there are dedicated architectures that try to do um, composition of these different uh, reservoirs, you see, uh, to different time scales. But another thing that I would say is that if you look at motifs extracted in the feature space, you would notice that some of these motifs have shorter memory, so they decay very fast. And some of these motifs have long-term memory, so they, they, they decay um, a bit. Uh, it takes a bit longer time to decay. They all decay. It's fading memory. Uh, they are de fading memory systems. And in this case, part of your feature space is sensitive to longer time scales, and parts of feature space is sensitive to short time scales. Okay. Um, have you any um, audience? Uh, have you any other questions, comments? I think you can turn off your mute. Um, you can ask, you can give uh, comments, questions, turning off your mute. That's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, great. It's a great talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you. See you. See you. Thanks. See you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.